Welcome, welcome everybody. Greg Peterson from Goodness Grows Organics in Asheville, North Carolina. That's the name of my farm. And, uh, I'm here with Don Titmus. Hello, Don. Hey, man. Uh, the BLA. Get... There you go. And, and we're here with Janice. Hello, Janice. Hello, everyone. I'm Janice Norton. I'm from the urban, I work with the urban farm, um, but my little place is called Two Peace in a Pod. And that's peace as in like the peaceful feeling. Two Peace in a Pod. Well, folks, today we are here to discuss permaculture. And we've titled this webinar while Greg is getting his... Now let me know when you're ready, Greg, but we're yep. doing this one, Intro to Permaculture. Yep. So, and Don and Janice, why do we do this one? Why? Why do we do the Intro why to not? Permaculture? Yeah, why, what's the point of Intro to Permaculture? Well, I think one of the reasons why we do Intro to Permaculture is because so many people have either never heard about it or have heard about it and are overwhelmed by some of the what they have heard about it or they have misconceptions. You know, they've they've created this image of what permaculture is as either something that's all about gardening or uh, this huge project you got to do to transform yourself into this super hippie world. Uh -huh. We want to we want to make sure they get a clear picture. Yeah, excellent. Talking about misunderstandings. Right after I did my PDC, that's Permaculture Design Course, and I did my Permaculture Design Course in 1991. Right after I did my Permaculture Design Course, within a couple of years, I was at this event in uh, mm -hmm. in Phoenix where I was teaching a a basic intro to permaculture class to a large group of people. And there was this guy there that showed up and he was standing in the back. I still see him to this day. Um, and he was emphatic. He said, you cannot do permaculture in the desert. It's not possible. And it's like, all right, well, there's a misconception. Yeah. So, and that's what we're going to bust today. I had, mm -hmm. uh, I get questions like that, you know, a couple of months where they say, can I do permaculture in my yard? I had a lady yes. that, that uh, emailed me and she said, I've got flood irrigation. Do I have to get rid of flood irrigation if I do permaculture? Like, ah, uh, okay, good clarity here. So, all yeah. right. So we are here to talk introduction to permaculture with Don and Janice and me, Greg. Um, I love this quote. You want to read it, Janice? What permaculturists are doing is the most important activity that any group is doing on the planet by Dr. David Suzuki. Yeah, I think in big part, he said that because what we're doing in permaculture is we're looking at natural systems and how they work and we're working in the flow of natural systems. And we'll talk about that more. Well, I think sure. the, the important part there is that the impact of what is being done by permaculturists is going to have an impact that can change the planet if we do yeah. it right. Yeah. Yeah, big time. So what is permaculture? Who wants to take the first one? Well, that's what? it. Go ahead, Don. Well, I was going to I was going to say, well, it's in the box. Permaculture is not only about gardening or composting. Oh, yeah. So yeah, uh Janice, want to take permaculture? Well, it's it's a, a mesh of two words, permanent and either culture or agriculture, to come up with this concept. And it's been around for forty years, Greg, forty About plus that. years. Yeah, that um, it, it was creating this this system as we humans can understand it that created you know you know that put together methodologies of of gardening of agriculture of living and um made it so that it could be understandable and taught cool excellent and it's really a design methodology a by which we look at how systems work in nature and then we design backwards from that rather than you know we human beings think that we know how to be do it better than nature and i love what the late great toby hemingway used to say he said he used to say nature always bats last nature will always win and we as human beings need to 
take note of that. And um, that's why that's one of the reasons I love permaculture is because it's again, we're looking at how natural systems work and how we can work with them. Yeah, I like that. That leads us into the holistic and systems based bullet point. Holistic meaning that we're not just focused on the garden, on the on the landscaping. We're not we're not looking at that. We're not looking at landscaping to be uh, all about appearance. We're looking at the landscape to be a part of the productive aspect of the whole home site. Each of it connected. One system's excess becomes a resource and an input for another system, making closed loop systems makes it more sustainable and therefore more regenerative. Uh, you, you know, you mentioned this whole circular closed loop thing. It never, never made sense to me that we throw things away. First of all, where is away? Right. And mm. when you look at natural systems in nature, there is n nothing that's wasted. Everything, 100% of everything in that system is used. Yeah. And, you know, so that's what we're really, that's where we're heading in understanding how to implement permaculture in our lives is how do we, that's one of the things you can do is how do we figure out how to not have any waste? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> I've been working hard on that. Yeah. Me too. I've made some improvements just this last month. Nice. Yeah. So Jan Janet, you want to talk about the next one? Observation. Uh, being observed is the, it, well, observing what's happening in your, in your environment gives you a better sense of being in there, what is there, what is working, what is not working, how systems are interplaying with each other which is a key part of permaculture and the to make an assumption that you know what is happening when you've looked at a space for a few minutes is really being a disservice to yourself and to anybody else who's having this conversation mm -hmm. with you mm -hmm. because you need to watch a space for a length of time even seasons to be able to understand what is happening. I personally went through a, a, a lesson, personal lesson, where my property that I had purchased had, um, I was ready to, to expand on it. And I, and I made a decision to do something, but I jumped into it too soon because I hadn't done the complete observation. I thought I really had, and there was something I missed. And um, and that's the story of the, the fruit tree slumlord that's on our yeah. website. And basically, observation over time is going to give you a clearer picture. And that's so important in permaculture is to be able to take note of how something is now and how something is as the seasons progress. Yeah, big time. I've said for years that you need to spend at least a year on a property before you make any major changes. And how, boy, how did he... Did I learn that lesson the past year and a half? Uh, for those of and you, you were, that... I'm sorry. And you were even trying not to do the big changes, but just, you know, making some changes yeah. you had to. Yeah. For those and of you that okay. don't know, for those of you that don't know, I moved from Phoenix, Arizona, where I lived for 54 years to Asheville, North Carolina, 18 months ago. And um, it has been a steep learning curve. So. And so. Yeah. The, Go ahead, Same Don. for me, coming from London, England, to yeah. to the literally to the desert, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah which exactly. I'd only visited once before. So you know, it, yeah, it was. I I hear you. Significant. So the thing about permaculture is, once you do your permaculture design course, you're going to have your own definition for yeah. what it for what it is. Mine is the art and science of working with nature. How do we work in the flow of nature? Either of you two want to jump in on that one? That that's a good classic elevator, uh, right? Option, right? You you always get trapped by that when you're in a group. It's like, oh, what's permaculture? It's like, oh man, do you have a day or a week? <laughs> right. 
No, I, I love it because for me, uh, permaculture it fits into the category of many other things I have in my life, which is a martial art. So, you know, I, I'm I'm into feng shui, which is a martial art. I'm into uh, yoga, which is a martial art. I'm into all kinds of things that that work with the elements. So that's permaculture. You're working with the elements and you're you're using them like in tai chi you go with the flow you you block here you allow it to go there you observe your eyes are always focused on what's ahead of you yeah well and that's the thing permaculture is in my world is a way of being you know so uh -huh. you can do you can do permaculture anywhere and everywhere as long as you're observing nature and how to, you know, work in the flow of nature and um, permaculture isn't gardening. Permaculture isn't aquaculture. Permaculture isn't um, growing fruit trees. Although all those things can be done in a permaculture manner. Oh yeah. It's, it's all the connections between all of those various aspects of a home size, how they connect. Mm-hmm. Does the, does the system, you know, create a hole or is it scattered? Is it broken? When you bring them together, they work synergistically together. Yeah. Now, for right. me, I think it really speaks right this moment to the individual, how that individual fits into and adopts permaculture. Your definitions spoke a lot about who you are and how you see life. For yeah. me, I'm systems. So yeah. my definition of permaculture is that it's a way of life that emulates, intersects, and cooperates with those continuously regenerative systems of nature. And there's 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 words, those words I chose specifically because it spoke to me about how nature's systems are so key to the solutions we're trying to create in our own lives. Yeah. And so my definition revolves around systems. Uh, and Janice is definitely a systems person. See? <laughs> yeah. All right. There we go. Don, you're up. Okay. <clears throat> Ethics to me is like <clears throat> how I... How I uh, it's in the it's in the back that background program in the back of my head. It's just like everything when I'm looking forward, I'm saying, okay, what can I do today to care for the earth? What can I do today to care for people? What can I do today to care for the future? How how is the future going to be better for the children and for the people that are, are still here that are living wherever they're living on the planet? And so by me saying, okay, I can take take care of the earth in my little location and wherever i'm out and about i can also do things like clean up after someone that's gone camping and they've left all their stuff behind i can you know i can pick that up i can make i can make a difference locally which it, it which rolls out i can become the example for others to follow or not uh but for me, the ethics are the 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 filter by which I say, okay, is this a good solution or a not so good solution? Does it stay or does it go? Does it stay or does it go? Cool. And then that sweet spot in the middle that we have a target right now. We, yeah. were, we were talking about changing that to a heart. <laughs> so it's... The, the target right now is the sweet spot in the middle so that each of the earth people future are all are are considered and that sweet spot in the middle then gives us the best option cool you know this it's a venn diagram and that's what we're looking at is that where it all overlaps yep perfect so permaculture was uh, penned, I'll use that word, by uh, Bill Mollison, who was a, a university professor, and David Holmgren, 
um, who was one of his students in, I'm going to say the late 60s, early 70s. Um, yeah, in the 70s, yeah. Late, yeah. Uh, yeah. And they put together design principles and this isn't the only set of design principles out there because as with you know most of permaculture it's a sliding scale so what we look at in our world is um, the eight basic principles of permaculture and we're going to go more deeply into these i'm just going to introduce them here um, observation seeing that's really the the entire process of learning how to do this is to go out and observe. So we'll talk right. about observations. Um, yeah, we, 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 we can call that reading the landscape. Yeah, exactly. It's also another term that could be, that other people might know. Yeah. Elements, number two is elements. So we're looking at each of, elements are the different parts of the landscape from wind to chickens to you know what are all the different pieces that you can uh, that you can follow and you know and plan from and then working with nature rather than against nature uh number four well, is, going with the flow again yeah going exactly and the the problem is the solution think about if you have a mess how can you turn that into a positive if you and have like a I problem, how is that something that's going to be something creative? Yeah. Like I said, we're going to dive into these deeper here in a minute. Um, number five, principle number five is make the least change for the greatest, greatest possible effect. Um, you know, do a little more work up front to put systems in place so that like at the urban farm in Phoenix, there was always something to eat in the yard. It just grew wild. My my yard just grew wild in Phoenix. Um, and then, oh, and I love this one. This is one of my favorite ones. The yield of the system is unlimited. I've said for years that the only place that lack lives is between our ears. Because when I look at a, a fruit tree or uh, an ash tree with leaves or a maple tree with leaves, it's the abundance is mind-blowing. And then there's number seven, the web effect. And we'll I'll let Don dig into that in a little while. And information <laughs> and imagination intensive. Uh, those are the eight principles. So let's go ahead. There we go. Um, Can we go back to Mollison's picture for just one second? Sure. Yeah. So Mollison decided to travel the world. He went to as many of the ancient cultures as he could find that were still active and still living you know, off off grid on the land, wherever they were, in tropics, deserts, you know, uh, uh, Arctic. He went all over, gathering information, writing it all down, and that that's what Greg said. He, Mollison penned the permaculture philosophy, but he didn't he didn't invent it. He just uh, condensed it. He, he gathered all this information and he just stuck it in that book. That book right there, That's that book is two inches thick. Yep. <laughs> it's a textbook size. It's a textbook and it's very detailed and he didn't do it alone. He did it with Holmgren and he did it with plenty of others that were coming along as he developed the permaculture, principles, ethics, practices, and all of that. So I just wanted to acknowledge his wanderings and his uh, dedication to uh, gathering all this information to share with the world. You know, this book came out uh, a little bit later in the early 80s. So it's it's only been around for that short period of time. But that book represents thousands of years of low technology and uh, community and all the other things that makes a village. A village. A village. It makes a village. There we go. All right. Observation. This yes is to Diane. First, this is the first premise of permaculture. Remember I said spend at least a year on a property before you make any major changes. I want you to be watching, looking. 
Where do the animals travel? One of the things that I learned is that on my four acres here out, outside of Asheville, I have deer that wander across the property every day. You know, we see deer all the time and they impact my fruit trees by eating the leaves. And uh, so when you're designing a permaculture process, the process is observe, plan, implement, observe. And you'll see this in a, in a slide here in a little while, but it really comes down to observation. So macro and micro. Yep, exactly. You know, one of the things that I have had to manage out here that I didn't have to manage in Phoenix was we get seven inches of rain in Phoenix a year. Yeah. We get wow. three to four inches of rain a month here. That's like 40 inches of rain here. So whereas I was managing rainwater harvesting in Phoenix to um, see how I could conserve and hold on to as much of that water as possible. Managing rainwater harvesting here is making sure I don't flood the dang house, you know? So, and that, you know, just, uh, that's done through observation. All right. Elements. You want to, who wants to take this one? Elements must have many functions. This has to speak with how a particular item, whether that be plant, animal, physical structure, um, how that is being utilized in your space. Now, when you're talking about an element having many functions, this picture here shows um, a, mm -hmm. a old grapefruit tree that at first served as shade, and then when it died, um, Greg allowed it to be a structure for a grapevine. And then when it finally uh, no longer could sustain itself in the location that it was, he used the wood to become the, um, the uprights for uh, a pergola. What we're talking about here is that particular element had was being used over and over again for many different functions. You can talk about functions being something real time all at the same time, or rather overlapping. For instance, you know, we talk a lot about the permaculture chicken in our courses, and a chicken can um, obviously provide food, whether that be the egg or eventually the chicken itself. And it also can serve as, you know, pest deterrent because it will um, eat the pests in your in your room. It loves to eat bugs. Um, it can help uh, add to your your recycling by um, adding you know parts of the chicken or the manure or whatever's in creating in the chicken becomes the byproducts become part of your compost pile. Um, it can be uh, it could be a pet. The list actually goes on for quite a while, but because the mm. chicken is doing many things, it is serving many functions, it has a greater value. And the more functions you can get out of a single item, the value is increased and therefore your, your expenses per value go down per item. Oh, that's a good way of looking at it. Cool. It's my systems, I'm back to systems. There you go. Ooh, Don, you wanna talk about patterns? Patterns. Um, we deal a lot with patterns during the design course because we're there to educate you on becoming a designer. And one, so one of those things is patterns. We look at patterns. We look at uh, we look at spirals, and that's one kind of pattern. That's uh, that's your hurricane. That's your tornado. That's your how wind patterns. That's the whirls in the river. Though those are they're the world patterns in um, you know nature's plants and different things. So when we're looking at patterns, we can already start to predetermine how they operate. So patterns give us information of what's happening on the land. And the land here, we, we have we can see high spots, we can see low spots, we can see where the trees are still there. They're not been harvested. Um, so that's an interactive forest. 
we can see in the distance that we can see that it's uh, like degraded land further away. But the land that we're looking at has been enhanced. So I can see like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, maybe nine ponds on this large acreage of land. Those have been designed so that we put in one wall uh, at, at a low point, and now the water is being caught behind that simple damn wall. And then now the resource that is vital for life has been held on the land so that it can be utilized whenever it's needed, where on what it's needed to be put upon. So we're gathering and storing resources on the land for now or for later. And patterns give us the clues to which we can make and enhance the land for greater sustainability. Yeah. Well, and it's interesting how many patterns there are all the way from microscopic to, you know, from satellites. They take pictures and, you know, the the river deltas uh, look sometimes like leaves. And, you yes, know, there's the branching fans, the branching yeah, exactly. of a tree, leaves, all kinds yeah. of things. Yes, it's amazing. And, yeah. the, and the patterns repeat themselves. You'll see them at a micro level. You'll see them at a, a standard level. You'll see them mm -hmm. at a macro level. Um, patterns work. Yes. And we in the so we're going to be talking about the permaculture design course in Phoenix here in a little while. And one of the exercises in the permaculture design course is to go out on a property, whatever property we're on that particular day, and look for patterns. Right. That's a that's a fun exercise because. Mm -hmm. Patterns are virtually endless when you start looking for them. Essential for any kind of sustainable slash regenerative home site. You yeah. got to look at patterns. Yeah. All right. The problem is the solution. Oh, this is another one that's Don, one's Don's favorite. So I'll jump <laughs> in, Don. Uh, you, you can talk about that fellow on the, on the balcony there on the, in, the, in an apartment complex. Look at that guy go. Yeah. Amazing. You know, just uh, some buckets. I mean, you can dumpster dive uh, around your neighborhood or go to any like uh, uh, house painter and said, you got any extra buckets, especially that I've had latex paint in latex paint is, you know, it's no real bad aspects to it. Mm -hmm. And when it's dried in the bucket, you can just like peel it right out. Mm. And now you've got a, a free bucket. Now you you locate some soil somewhere. Maybe you can buy broken bags at Home Depot or some other box store. Maybe you can, you know, uh, scrounge some compost from someone, add it to some native soil and put it in the bucket and grow at least some, you know, leafy veggies on yep. your balcony. Yeah. Well, and what I used to do when I was in Phoenix is I used to harvest food waste from a local restaurant. Right. And I was getting 10 five gallon buckets a week of food waste and tea fines and coffee grounds. Yeah. I and remember those are, you had a great big bathtub full of coffee grounds. Yeah. And worms. With all your red wiggler worms in there, your composting. Yeah, worms. yeah. exactly. Perfect. So the the problem in in the restaurant's case is that they had they were throwing away. 10 buckets of food waste every week. And so the, the solution landfill. to the landfill. So the solution was I'm going to take it, I'm going to compost it. And then, Oh my gosh, we did so many things with those buckets. It was, yeah. it was amazing. All right. Make the least change for the greatest possible effect. You want to tackle this one, Janice? I think that when you are looking at a project, it is so easy to start making a list of what you need to do and you can get overwhelmed. Well, our, what happens when you start changing things is you start having consequences, whether those be unintended or intended. What happens if you start small and you start making a change 
that is going to get you a desired effect, hopefully. By going small, either you can build the unintended consequences or the consequences into the end result, and you don't have to work so hard. That basically what that means is if you are looking at like a tree and you want to develop it for a particular corner or a particular uh, pro, uh, you know, purpose, you want to have a tree that is just going to be growing fruit or you just want it for shade. If you try to work at it too fast with the big changes, your results are going to be a lot of effort and not getting you the results that you want. If you start small and you trim and you prune it slowly to get it eventually the way you want, it's going to grow into the desired end result with the least amount of work for yourself. And by observing the changes that you make as you make them, Mm -hmm. you can see the little effects and what you might need to do to keep nudging it into the direction that you're wanting to go. So if you were going to, you know, build a whole new backyard by starting slow and making it just a little bit at a time, you can see how the effects or the impacts of that change will affect everything else. So you don't have to work so hard to get it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. And, and by, for instance, in my backyard, I wanted to have an orchard. Well, I found out when I started digging that there was this huge slab of uh, a concrete like substance called caliche in the backyard. What I could have done was brought in a big you know, machinery to dig it all out, to put the trees in, um, and then eventually, you know, have to plant the trees, et cetera, at great effort and expense and damage to the environment and noise to my neighbors, et cetera. Lots of, lots of issues that could have created with that. But by slowing down and looking at what I had, I realized that a simpler, easier process would be to build up my space, build in and bring in some soil and some compost and to create an environment that my trees could thrive in that didn't require me to do all of this construction work. So by making a small change, a slow change, I worked with my space and I created a beautiful orchard, which you can see behind me. And I didn't have to uh, lay out the expense of this big dig. Nice. Thank you. All right. Well, I think this particular one, first of all, this is a a picture a few years later. That's the old dead citrus tree there that you saw in a picture four or five slides ago uh, with the grapevine that was growing on it. And it's cascading over to the, you know, to the structure of the back, you know, the back patio structure. So, um, and how long did you have that grapevine? The grape, the grapefruit tree that died in 2004 was planted in the 1920s. Yeah, no, I'm talking about the grapevine because I'm looking at that 45 degree angle of that limb coming off of the left hand side. And yep. that is the grape trunk. Yep, exactly. <laughs> and so that grapevine grew that way from 2004 to 2014. Uh, that wow. was 10 years. And then like Janice said earlier, when the tree finally rotted off at the ground level, I cut it in pieces and it is now holding up the pergola that is over the outdoor kitchen. So, um, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, the abundance in nature is is just mind boggling. And our, our job in permaculture is to put those systems in place so that we get that abundance, so we can harvest that abundance. And one of the ways that I did it at the urban farm at this property here was that I uh, planted open pollinated seeds. So that means that when they, the plants like carrots and, and basil and, you know, all the vegetables that I would eat would go to seed, I would just spread those seeds around the property and 
the plants would just come back year after year after year on their own. So that's the abundance there. And and real in permaculture, we like to really play on and work with that massive abundance. And so there you go. Do you mind if I talk about while you're there? Go back yeah, one. I can. You mind talk about the ethics, right? We're talking about care of the earth. Yep. Can you see some of that in this picture? Care of the people. So we've, we've created shade over the, the back patio, which is also an outdoor kitchen and has a mm -hmm. stove and has a sink and it has different things. And you can see care of the future. If you look under the grapefruit tree, can you see new trees that were planted mm -hmm. at the base of the old tree that was dying back? Yep. So right in that picture, three of those three ethics are an example right there. Yeah, there's the tree. That's it. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Be absolutely. Thank you. The web effect. You get to talk about this one, Don. Where, where everything's connected. We cannot connect ourselves from nature. We are part of nature. Nature is part of us. We're the same, you know, uh, elements in it. We're we're carbon. We're hydrogen. We're we're all of those things. We're all those things. So the web effect is in how all of those things works together as a positive rather than a negative. So we're looking at the yin yang aspect, maybe if mm -hmm. you associate to that. The picture in front of you, uh, the primary element in this in this image is the apple tree. The apple tree is that circular dead center. Right Below there. it on the ground is ground cover, My favorite. which also happens to be food. Those are sweet potatoes. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a hedge, uh, a citrus hedge to the right. And there's the neighbor's mulberry drooping down on the left. And uh, this this tree, which is growing and producing food, is also connected to the house. It's off screen to the left. Yeah, right over, uh, right over Greg's, here. Greg's internal bathroom uh, was was uh, replumbed with a jandy valve on it, so that his bath water uh, could come and sink water could come out of that building, went down into the ground. And then we piped it over to where this apple tree is. We dug a chamber to put a container in there that is the surge pot for the gray water from the house. So yeah. the apple is thriving because it's connected to the house. Gray water. Nice. But You're going to have to down the sewer. We've intercepted it with the jandy valve and we're putting it out into the landscape. Can you really quickly explain what a jandy valve is? Oh, oh yes. It, you can, yeah, it's like just like a, a switch. So you can, it can go to the sewer one way and it can go to the landscape the other and it's completely off the other way. It's used a lot on uh, swimming pools. Yeah. The jandy valve, the back flush. Cool. And w one of the cool things is back in, this was back in 2004 five or 2006 when we did this we actually did the installation around a course so remember we over the course of a weekend we brought yes. in we brought in uh brad brad lancaster and we did a workshop where we installed it so that yes. we you know we got to teach people about gray water harvesting um and then we got a gray water system installed right so, all right. And the final one, Don, you're up. I love this oh, one. I am uh, a low tech and high tech when appropriate person. So yeah. the more low tech we can do, the less we have to maintain, the less work we have to do to keep the thing running, to you know, to fix it when it's broken. If you do more low tech stuff, more passive flow, it's like th th there's there's no once you built it, you can just leave it. It's just going to run by itself. A passive flow system is far more 
efficient and sustainable than an active system where you have to have pumps, you have to have machines, you have to have this thing and that thing, a computer, all those kind of things. So imagination and information intended, we're bringing those things together. We're setting no limits in the beginning. The limits come later as we find ourselves where we're at. Can we afford this fancy uh, a solar system or do we just do something else instead? You know, we need to look at options and or we bring we... those options in. We, 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 are they care? Do they care for the earth? Do they care for people? Do they, does it care for the, does it have an influence on the future, a positive influence on the future? And we can start to synergize these things down so that we can create the best home site that we can possibly design and we put that all on paper and then we have a document that we can share with others because I, I don't do I don't do everything on my home site. I don't know nothing about solar, but I know people that know solar. You know, I can't climb my big pine tree anymore. So but I know arborists that can climb my pine tree, but I know how to prune it. And I can say, yeah, not that one. No, not that one. That one. I can do that. Because I'm part of my, I'm, I'm an integral part of my home site. I've been here since 1991, and I, but I took my design course in 03, no, 04. Yeah, somewhere in there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the same. And and yes, multiple disciplines can be adopted to solve any challenge. And as we come in again, you know, the problem is the solution. You know, the in making the greatest you know yield for the least all of these all come to play they're all together we've separated them into eight so they can be understandable but those eight work together to be to create that sustainable regenerative home site perfect so we do thank you for that don and uh we do have some questions in the chat if you have questions if you can drop them in the q a that's better Although I'm, uh, I see them there, and we'll um, we'll jump into the questions here in just a couple of minutes. I want to talk about a couple of courses that we offer. Uh, first of all, you know where do you go from here? Um, I am a big, big proponent. I went back to college at the age of 39, got a bachelor's and a master's. The thing is, between my college time and the time I went back, I had taken over 30 different classes at a community college that of uh, things that I was interested in. I'm a lifelong learner. And the nice thing is, is that, you know, since about 2010 or so, there's so many more opportunities to learn. So here at Urban Farm, we've got those opportunities. We have online courses. We have in-person courses. There's the Urban Farm podcast, um, you know, and we're building community around that. So I really encourage you to keep learning. Um, we were lucky enough to uh, know, and I was good friends with Toby Hemingway before he passed away. He wrote the book Gaia's Garden, the top-selling permaculture book on the planet. And he wrote a book a few years ago called Permaculture City. And we turned that course, that book into a course. So we actually were able to preserve his teachings. This is Toby. Um, and uh, who is a bright spot in a lot of people's lives. And so we have a course called Creating Your Permaculture City with Toby. It's nine re pre recorded online classes. Uh, it's uh, structured so that you, you, it's self paced. You just watch when you want. Um, and I think uh, Raymond made us uh, worksheets for all of them, didn't he, Janet? Yes, yeah. He did. So we have He's working on them. We're, we've got most of them up. Cool. Um, and there's access to the Urban Farm Facebook group and tons of extra content. There's an amazing amount of content in that comes with creating your permaculture city. Um, the thing is, we've always sold it for 197 And between now and, well, it says 72 hours, uh, for about the next week, we're selling it for $49. So if you want an extraordinary experience, 
of learning from one of the top permaculture people on the planet, we have that available for you. You can go to permaculturecity.com uh, and that'll take you to a data page on the course itself. And like I said, it's self-paced and you're going to learn a lot. There is a 30 day money back guarantee. And then there's our local to Phoenix. So if you're in the low desert within driving distance of Phoenix, this is something to consider. This is our permaculture design course. Here's the thing. If you're not local to Phoenix, put in the name of your city that you live near and permaculture design course. And there is highly likely going to be a permaculture design course in your area. So um, for us, we've been, this is our uh, 19th. I think this is our 2024 will be our 19th annual permaculture or maybe the 18th annual permaculture design course. We've been doing a long time. Don and I started in 2006. Yes. The four um, or six. Yep. Yeah. 2006 and for a few years we offered two a year we offered one in the fall and one in the spring that's right so the phoenix permaculture design course uh, starts february 11th um, for more information you can go to urbanfarm.org forward slash pdc if you're interested in talking about being in the course if you have questions you can email me greg at urbanfarm.org and we can uh, get on a phone call um, here's what I promise you. It will change your life. Doing a 72 hour introduction to permaculture, permaculture design course. For me, it was an acknowledgement that there was something that we could call the way that I think, because in 1981, this was 10 years before I did my permaculture design course in 1981, I designed a what we would now call a regenerative fish farm on paper. I just drew it all out because I visited this fish farm in Arizona in 1981. They were harvesting and cleaning the fish and throwing away everything that was left. They were throwing away 70% of the fish, the entrails and the bones and that kind what of stuff. What a waste. It was, and it just didn't make sense to me. Didn't make sense. So um, I designed this farm where everything got used and it only produced a usable thing, whether it was food or fertilizer or mulch or compost, it, it, everything got used in the system. So you, a permaculture doing a permaculture design course will absolutely change your life. I promise you that. If you go to urbanfarm.org forward slash PDC, um, you can find more. Oh, and what's included. So here's the deal. If you do the local Phoenix permaculture design course, um, I should say 2024 Phoenix PDC, um, we're going to throw in as part of your uh, tuition, the introduction to the book. Jan uh, you probably can't see it, but Janice is holding up the introduction to permaculture book. Um, Plus, we're going to throw in Toby's online permaculture city course. So you're going to get that learning as well. So if you go to um, for the permaculture design course, urbanfarm.org forward slash PDC. If you want to know more about Toby's course, you go to permaculturecity.com. We do have a permaculture frequently asked questions. I mean, a frequently yeah. asked questions page for the PDC. So when you go to that page down at the bottom, there's mm. a link to the frequently asked questions. Yeah. I do want to make sure that people will understand that we're not having you in class from February to April. This uh. is five weekends, <laughs> five weekends and, and stuff in between, but we're not going to make it come every day from February to April. There you the, go. The dates for the 2024 class are listed on the website. Yeah, perfect. Perfect. So Lee is out in Mesa, Chandler. He says, I'm looking to convert an acre plus property, my primary residence into a micro farm. But at 62 years old, I need guidance. We're yes. in Chandler, five miles south, five miles south of downtown Chandler. So multiple things here for you. First of all, um, we do 
garden consults, farm consults, uh, virtual consults. Don and I do water harvesting consults and we do those virtually. So we just get on a Zoom call. And, um, you know, those, they come with a money back guarantee. So Lee, that is a uh, one good starting point. That's a good starting point. Um, but I'll tell you what, I started, I'm 62 years old too, Lee. And I moved when I was 60, one years old, I moved all the way across the country to what you're seeing in the background, four acres. And I am implementing permaculture principles here at my new place at the age of 62. So, hey, you're just getting started, man. Janice? Raymond, another one of our um, people that are available to do consults, um, virtual consults, he took the course at 67. There you go. So, yeah, don't count yourself out yet, Lee. Yeah, exactly. So, and, and, and you know, Lee, uh, since you're local, I can visit you. It costs more yep. for me to visit you, but that is also an option. Yeah. Don does in person consults. So, you can, uh, what's your email address, Don? Permidon at gmail.com. So, there you go. <laughs> Kay Nell says, oh, you young people, I'm 76. Yay! Yay, yay, yay. yay. So, and, Good. you know, turning your place into a micro farm, it's something you could do over the next five to 10 years. You just do a little it and a little it and a little it and a little it, and it happens. It magically yep. happens. Just get like your master plan first. I'd like to speak to Diane's comment. What's Diane that? says, I don't really have any systems available on my mm. property, save for one lonely ponderosa pine, 36 vacant acres at 9,000 feet in southern Colorado, high and dry and very windy, lots of snow, and it's located in the valley, and the acreage is hilly. The only improvements are a driveway and a well is dug. Mm. By Perfect. using observation, you will be surprised at how many systems you have in place. Yeah. yeah. They're there already are, there. There already are. The three of us could probably start listing, come up with half a dozen right off the bat. Water so, harvesting. There's exactly. Yeah. Right. What, I mean, hills and valleys. Hills and valleys, well, right. soil creation, yeah. water. The there's yeah. one of the one of the things that I did here um this past summer at my new four acre farm in Asheville is I planted 160 fruit trees and berry bushes. And what I did, and you'll learn this in your permaculture design course. When did you, you do that it. all by yourself? Uh, no, 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 no. There was about 10 of us that worked on it, on it over the course of three months. He yeah. tried by himself and realized very quickly that he should get help. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so what I did, a swale is an on-contour ditch. On-contour means that it's the same elevation as it travels across a ledge. See, and he did this and he dipped, but with an on contour would be the same no matter go. where the world goes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And um, so what I did is I dug trenches on those contours. And they're called swales in permaculture. So they're along the contour of the of the hill. And when the water comes, when the rainwater comes, remember three to four inches a month, those swales are designed to capture that water. And, and that's slow where- And slow the sink. And slow it and sink it, exactly. And um, that's, where, that's where I planted my fruit trees. All my fruit trees are on contour swales in two different orchards on the property here. So, and that's just, you know, there's so much there for you, Diane. Um, and that's the cool thing about a permaculture design course is that, it it's you know it opens up your eyes it opens up your eyes um gaynell, gaynell yay what's that gaynell has uh, uh added to her collection of urban farm courses oh very good cool um gaynell says here she says are you potentially inviting things you don't want into your environment when we were bringing in the buckets of food from the restaurant GMO and non-organic matter, for example, when using waste from restaurants and other sources. 
here's Don, put your uh, email in I the got it. chat. Okay, good. Um, here's the thing, Danelle. <laughs> you want me to do that? That's no, too I got it. <laughs> okay. Uh, here's the thing, Gaynell. Um, we live in a very, very, very polluted world. I don't think we can get away from all the Completely. pollutants. So we have to do the best we can do. What I do know is that the restaurant that I worked with um, was a more natural, more organic-ish restaurant. And the stuff we were getting was pre-consumer waste. So it was the ends of heads of lettuce and celery and carrots and that kind of stuff. So, um, you know, could there have been GMOs in there? Probably not because there were not. Most likely um, not, but there's a possibility, just not enough to worry about. Yeah. And but then during the, the composting process, the, the links between the elements that make a compound are broken. So that yeah. only the elements are left and it's no longer a, a harmful compound. Yeah. If you do your so, composting correctly. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Right. Right. All right. Well, there folks, we, we have, we've already had, I think we're up to maybe nine registrants at the moment. So we don't have that many spots left. If you are considering and joining the PDC, grab your slot soon. You get to take advantage of the early bird discount. Yep. And um, just give yourself the gift of life. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. All right, Miss Janice, any final thoughts? Uh, that was mine. All right, but, Don. Um, thank you, folks. Yeah. Any final thoughts, Don? Two thumbs up. All right. So here's, <laughs> here's the thing a permaculture, learning permaculture, if you engage in it, will absolutely change your life. Whether you're taking Toby's course, a permaculture design course where you live or the Phoenix permaculture design course, it will change your life. So, you know, I just and encourage you to jump in and keep learning. Go ahead, Janice. I'm sorry. I just realized by joining the Phoenix permaculture course, you will be joining the Phoenix permaculture community. Yes. We have an amazing community of people right now that are all interacting and supporting and, you know, helping each other get their stuff done. Yep. And they're collaborating. They're public, time. right? So, I, I've had know, multiple this... chats this morning already. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, so um, if we if you decide to jump into the permaculture design course, it starts in February. Um, and, uh, you know, jump into the uh, permaculture city course. You can do that. Um, Lee wants to know, is the Urban Farm Facebook page in Phoenix still live? It absolutely is. So here's the thing, Lee. The only thing that changed when I left Phoenix was that I sold the Urban Farm to an That's... amazing family that are, they're absolutely honoring what we did there and they're loving every minute of it. But we still offer all the same programs. We still offer our fruit tree program. We still do the permaculture design course. We still do we still do all that. And I just come back to I fly to Phoenix during the time of year when I need to be there. Yes, Janice. He sold the property that the urban farm is the location of the house and the property. He didn't sell the business. Right. Exactly. So we're still totally active with that. So yay. All right. Thank you, Don and Janice. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. If you have any questions, um, if you want to get a hold of Don, it's permidon at gmail.com. And that's in the chat box. Or, you know, I'm Greg at urbanfarm.org. Janice is Janice at urbanfarm.org. I'm Jan is at urbanfarm.org. There you go. There you go. All right, guys. Good Thank job, you. everybody. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Bye.